1 John chapter 3, we'll pick it up at verse um, 4. Stand at the reading of God's holy word, please. Let's actually uh, pick it up at verse 3, 1 John 3, 3, and we'll go down to 9. Everyone who has this hope, the hope he's talking about goes back to 228, the fact that we get to see Jesus, the fact that we will, we could be unashamed and confident at his appearing, the fact that we'll be transformed and be like Jesus when we see him. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning, and no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. Father God, thank you so much for your holy word. And Lord, thank you so much for the encouragement that, that when you moved Holy Spirit upon John and carried him to write this, let that very heart that comes from the heart of God come through to us, Lord. This is not a word of condemnation, it's a word of great hope and joy and security. And Lord, I pray that you'll give me the ability to communicate it as such and that our hearts will just hear that. In Jesus' name, Lord, we love you and we bless you. Hallelujah. Help us to grab a hold of the truth of this word now. And Lord, I know it will transform us. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for showing us these things. In Jesus' name. Turn around and say to one another, you can win over sin. Go ahead, would you please? <clears throat> Amen. How many in this room, um, by a show of hands, would say you love Jesus with all your heart? And I think we've got a majority here. How many of you would also, with a show of hands, confess that we have seasons, you'll have a season where you'll struggle over a tough sin issue of one sort or another? Anyone here? Oh, the same people. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Sin is like a bully. It comes and it victimizes us. And it tries to give our holiness a black eye as often as it can. And our Father, our Father God, is a loving and good and wise Father. And because he's loving and he's good and he's wise, he does what every good, loving, wise father does for his children when they have bullies. He makes them face their own bullies themselves. But then he gives us truth and gives us the stuff to equip us to overcome them so that we don't have to be victimized by our bullies. Again, we don't have to be victimized by the sin bullies in our life. Now the good news is, is that throughout the Bible, God has graciously given us profound truths that, get this, guarantee that we'll have victory over our sin issues. And today's passage is what I call a grand guarantee. Now in order to get the heart of what John is saying, 
we have to remember the context. Remember the context goes back to 2.28 where, where he tells us, now dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, you and I can have confidence and, and be unashamed before him at his coming. Remember that? And then he gives, in four verses, he gives four reasons why we can have this kind of confidence. He told us that in 229 that when we are born of him that Jesus' righteousness literally becomes a transformative trait that we grow in and we live out in our life. You can have confidence when Jesus comes back and you see Jesus because right now God's Jesus' righteousness is imputed to you by faith but it's more than just something you legally have. It is something that dynamically is changing you and changing your behavior. And then he goes on, he told us in 3.1 that we can have confidence because we possess the abundant resource of God's love that's already in our hearts and what Tony was just sharing with us about. And then in 3.2, we can have confidence because the moment we see Jesus, the Bible says, we will be made like him. Do you realize that means that we will not take our, our own residue of personal lack, residue of our own failures, residue of our own sin, things that we were just not completely done with? Did you know you're not taking that into heaven? That will be gone and removed from you once and for all. For you will be made like Jesus. And then according to 3.3 that we'll see here, that... God has made provision for our continual cleansing. Now I want you to take in consideration, Mike, why don't you put that up there, 3-3, three, three, number one. Um, take into consideration this verse 3, that the fact that we are now living in a hope-driven lifestyle that daily, we're daily purifying ourselves. Amen? And remember we talk, everyone, read it with me, would you? Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And then we asked last week, well, how does one purify himself? Well, 1 John 1, 7, it says, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you'll have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus is the, te the tenses is constantly purifying you from all sin. And then we read in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and constantly be purifying us from all unrighteousness. And then we looked at, we looked at um, what was it? Oh, 1 Peter 1, 22, where, where 1 Peter says, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. And then we also saw how in Acts 59 that says that God purified their hearts by faith. So how do we purify ourselves? How do we continue to walk clean before the Lord? Well, we walk in the light as he is in the light. In other words, we, we love God, reverence God, believe what the Bible says about God, relate to God according to his revelation. The next thing is, is we live a daily lifestyle of repenting and confessing our sins. Right? And then, and then we begin to obey the word of God. And that has its own purifying effect in our hearts and lives. And then we just keep putting our faith in Jesus. And our faith in Jesus. There's a purification that comes because of it. All right. Now, would you agree with me that that is an emotional tone the writer is writing in? He does not change his emotional tone from verse 3 to verse 4. But it's amazing when we begin to read this as Christians and we're novice followers of the Lord, we tend to take verse 4 through 9 as something really condemning, something really warning, something really, wow, you're in big, big trouble. The author has not changed his emotional tone. He is still very positive about the good things that God has given us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So that's the way we have to read this. We have to read it from the author's given emotional tone. Now, in order for us to understand verses 4 through 9, um, 
we'll find out that John employs what's called the present participle tense to a lot of verses. Spurgeon says the sermon is in the tenses. And when it comes to 1 John 3, 4 through 9, that is true. Our problem is, is in our English le language, the suffixes we would use upon a word to, to mean an ongoing theme is not strong enough. It does not have the same impact that the Greek language had. So in order for us to understand what John was saying, I'm going to have to add a couple words to certain verses and certain words to get the impact and give us the understanding of what John really means. Okay? So are you up for that? Okay, for instance, let's look at verse 4. John is contrasting. He's, the first three said, everyone who has this hope purifies himself. And now he's contrasting with every one of those everyone's with everyone, read it with me, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Notice the, the sins and the little s there of the first everyone who sins. The present participle is attached there. This is what it literally means in the Greek. Everyone who habitually sins without repenting breaks the law. In fact, sin, its nature, is lawlessness. So, what is he saying? As opposed to us, who is daily living how to walk in our cleansing that he has provided us, as opposed to us, there are people who are habitually living in sin without repentance. And basically what he's saying is, not only are they breaking the law, Basically, he's saying they're under the condemnation of the law because they're not saved. Now he's going to contrast it again. Look at verse 5. Read it with me. But you know that he appeared that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. You need to say praise the Lord about this. Amen? As believers in Christ, the Bible says we're cleansed from sin, we're free from the power of sin, we're forgiven for our sins, and we're overcoming our sins by His grace. The Bible tells us those sins that we confess, according to the Bible, they're declared forgotten by God, that's Hebrews 10, 17, and that they're also removed from us as far as the east is from the west. Amen? And that's according to Psalm 103, 12. Now, there is, a, there is, in a lot of these verses, in a lot of kingdom truths, there is a present reality, and then there is a future absolute reality. The present reality now is, is that we are not free from the condition of sin itself, right? But hallelujah, when we call out to him and we cry out to him to forgive us for our sins, even if we commit the same sin 20 times over in that day, if our heart is, Lord, I didn't want to do it, and there it was again, and oh God, I repent. He has cleansed you. He has removed it. But brothers and sisters, there is going to be a time, a day, this glorious day, where Jesus will once and for all do away with the very presence and the very condition of sin to where sin will no longer exist and it can no longer happen in God's creation. So if you ask the question, when I'm in heaven, you know, and a million years from now, can I get a bad attitude and mess up and then be thrown into hell? No, no bad attitudes in heaven. You're totally transformed. And the condition of sin, the, the essence of sin, the possibility of sin, that has been long removed from the fabric of all that God has created. Hallelujah. So the question then is, so why doesn't God do that with us right now? Right? 
Wouldn't that be nice if we came to the altar and we prayed a right prayer and we waited on God and all of a sudden, whammo, something from heaven just comes upon us and the very condition of sin has left our bodies. Elvis has left the room. You know, sin has left the body and we, can't, we couldn't sin if we even wanted to sin. Wouldn't that be great? So why doesn't God do it? It's not beyond his possibility. I wonder, I wonder if God sees value in the issue of our grappling with sin. I wonder if God sees value in the fact that when you're struggling with a sin issue, though you're repenting, and it's the same sin issue, that God sees how that is actually casting pride out of yourself. Religious pride. I wonder if God sees that that's causing you to depend on him more than ever before. I wonder if that's causing you to come to the realization that you could not fix sin in yourself if you even tried. And I wonder if when we start coming to that kind of reality that there is something way more being developed in us than simply a deliverance from a certain kind of sin. Will he forgive us? Yes, he will. Will he cleanse us? Yes, he will. Will he remove that from us finally? Yes, he will. But not the total condition until we see Jesus face to face. Because there's something about our propensity that we think we could fix it. And we think that we, we, you know, are good enough. And sometimes, if you and I live sinless lives, we would fall like Satan did because of our pride. Right? Or is that only just me? <laughs> That's right. So isn't that interesting? So what provisions does God make? Well, we're going to see. But now, he says this in verse 6. And this is the where it hangs us up. By the way, by the way, before we get to verse 6. Any of you, when you began living your life and you started noticing for the Lord and you got saved and you started noticing that there are certain sin habits that you had that's greater than other sins. And did you ever try to cut a deal with God? If you'll just forgive me this one more time, I'll never ever do that. Right? And then you do it and you think, oh no, I'm in big trouble. I want to let you know something. God doesn't cut deals. God ignored you when you said that. He didn't forgive you on the basis of the deal you cut. He forgave you on the basis of his great love, on the basis of his great grace, and on the basis of Jesus. You try to make a deal with God, God says, here's my deal. I give you Jesus, period. Amen. Amen. This is my deal. Amen? All right. So then we come to verse 6, especially as novice Christians. And this verse just bowls us over. It kills us. Because we think, oh no, we're in such big trouble, we're probably not saved. Read it with me. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or knows him. Okay, two things. Now, to, in order to translate this and get the truth, what's the emotional tone of the writer? Positive, hopeful. Encouraging, right? Second of all, what's the tense? See, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. See that? The tense is the perfect or the present participle tense. In other words, what he's saying is this. No one who lives in him keeps on habitually sinning without repentance. And then again, he says, see that word continues to sin? Again, present participle. No one who continues to habitually sin without repentance has neither seen him or know him. So what is he saying in this statement? Basically, because in Jesus there is no sin, 
We just read it. Jesus can't help but confront sin and conquer sin in those who receive him. Jesus does not let sin in our lives idly stand by. His Holy Spirit continues to work and don't we feel convicted right away? And doesn't the Holy Spirit give us godly sorrow right away? And his conviction and his godly sorrow always leads us to repentance. So you might have a sin hang-up, and we all do. Remember the old records, record players and records? And on the records, you, you know if there was a scratch on part of the record, the song is going and then it hits the scratch and it bounces, it makes the needle bounce back. And then you have to kind of touch the, the needle so it could keep going, right? Your life is like an old record. And some of you, you're almost all the way done on that 33. Some of you have just begun. Some of us is three quarters of the, you know, whatever, only God knows. But did you know that your life, the record of your life, has a bunch of these scratches in them? They do. And, and God has already forgiven you and has already delivered you of some of those things. But understand this. He's not talking about the fact that we will have certain kinds of sins that we go da 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 That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the person who's da 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 and then when he comes to push the needle, we go da 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 don't you touch that, I want that, da 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 don't, I love it, da 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 Right? And that's not us. Jesus is there to cleanse us, to forgive us, to deliver us, and hallelujah, to push the needle. Amen. Because a record cannot do it itself. And neither can we. No one who lives in Jesus, no one who has this abiding relationship in Jesus, can keep on sinning without repentance because Jesus has ruined sin in us. Hallelujah. But you know what? The person who can keep sinning and do it habitually and not be sorry for it and want to do it, that's the evidence they don't know Jesus yet. They haven't seen or know him. Christian, is that last part of verse 6 you? No! Because you're repenting. Some, someone said it like this. How many sins does God remember? None. And then when you ask him to forgive you for the sin you just did, it's cleansed and it's forgiven. But then if you sin the very same sin 20 seconds later and said, I did it again, God will say, I don't know about again. All he sees is the blood of Jesus. This is the first time in my books that you did this. And this is good news. But the better news is, is that God has a solution. Your record doesn't have to keep skipping until you die. Amen? Hallelujah. So look what, he, look what he says here in verse 7. Read it with me. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. So he's reemphasizing the truth that he gave in uh, 2.29, that when we're born of him, Jesus' righteousness is imputed to us by faith, but also Jesus' righteousness becomes a transformative trait that we grow in and that we live out in our life. And so you're going, you know, what is it? I really can love my brothers and sisters, but I still really mess up in this area of my life. And what John is basically saying is this. When you start tracking characteristics of Jesus happening in your life, it might not happen all the way, and it might not be perfect, and you might not, but you start seeing behavioral changes in your life that looks like Jesus is. It's because Jesus is there, and it's because righteousness is working inside of you, and you are being transformed. 
He says, don't be deceived. Don't let the enemy say, oh, you're 90% doing good and you got that 10% problem. Go on to hell. He says, don't be deceived by that. Be encouraged that the Lord is working his work in your life. Amen? Amen? Does this make sense to the text? I hope so to you. Now, he's going to contrast it. Here's verse 7. We who are doing righteously because he's righteous and because he's working that out in our life, contrast that again then with verse 8. The other kind of people. Read it with me. He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Again, the present participle. He who does what is sinful is, is attached there. It's also attached to the devil has been sinning from the beginning. So we have to read it like this. He who habitually does what is sinful without repentance is of the devil because the devil has been habitually sinning without repentance from the very beginning. Okay? And we know people. Now get this. Wasn't that all of our condition before we were saved? We were habitually sinning and didn't care about it and didn't want to change it. Thank you very much. We belong to our father, the devil, according to Jesus. How then was it possible that any of us got saved? Not by any works of our own. Not by any good thinking of our own or any good decisions of our own. We were all saved by God's great grace. God interrupted the work of Satan in our life and brought the truth and the conviction and the life and we said yes and we were born again Amen. but God is the prime mover the first mover in all things including our salvation hallelujah hallelujah and the best part of this verse is the last part the reason the son of God appeared was to do what destroy the devil's work and he already began destroying the devil's work in you and will carry it to completion Amen. glory to God hallelujah so then he says in verse 9 and I want you to understand this now we're going to read this together but I want you to hear it out of the heart of God this is not John's opinion this is not are well we hope this is true this is birthed from the very insides of God's heart God's truth God's will God is declaring verse 9 to your soul this is God's absolute eternal truth so now that I say that Read verse 9. With that knowledge, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born again. Do you hear your father speak to you? You have come to him over and over. What's wrong with me? I'll never get over with this. What's the matter with me? I am such a whip. I'm such a terrible. I don't even know. I don't even know. What's the matter? And the father says, you are born of me. You will not, daughter. You will not, son, continue in this. My seed remains in you. You are born again. Amen. Hallelujah. Would you hear that? as you're dealing with your present sin issue. What is this seed? It's a metaphor for the new life, the essence of God's life in us. And because God's life is in us, he declares you and I cannot go on sinning, hallelujah. 
So what we need to do is instead of look to the Father and tell us what a, what a jerk and what a hopeless idiot we are, what we need to do is look at sin and say, oh, you're going to be gone. For my Father has spoke to you, and my Jesus is my Lord. I will be set free. And that's taken a biblical stance of faith towards even the hardest of our sin habits and issues. That's why the Word of God tells us in Romans chapter 6, count yourself therefore dead to sin and alive to God. Why? Just because we're psyching ourselves into it? No, God has declared in this verse, verse 9 here, that we cannot go on sinning. Hallelujah. And we're to just walk in this liberty and walk in this hope. And I messed up again, God. I did mess up again. But Lord, it was never about me. It's never about me making myself stop. If it's up to me, that, that will keep skipping all my life. God, it's up to your love. It's up to what you have for me. You have planted your seed of eternal life in me. Jesus is in me. The Holy Spirit is working in me. I have hope in you, O oh Lord. Now, wouldn't that be the coolest thing to say to someone who calls you up and they're so full of condemnation because of their screw-ups? Say, I know it's bad and we'll pray and I know the Lord will cleanse you and forgive you today, but he's got a word for you. He condemned your sin in you and it's dying from the roots up. And it cannot survive. Amen. Glory to God. And that's the truth. Ooh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, YouTubers. Ooh, this is so great. This is a liberating word, is it not? Amen. All right, so let's bow our hearts. Come on up, Sister Teresa. Oh, hallelujah. Why don't you just thank God for that seed that remains in you? Why don't you just thank God for Jesus? The reason he came is to take away sin. And the reason he came is to destroy the devil's work. Instead of just always having this guilt posture before God and this, uh, I'm, I'm such a terrible, instead of that, why don't, let's just grab a hold of his truth about us and say, God, dare I? I dare believe your word. All we can say, Lord, is thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, we confess our sin. Yes, we confess our ineptness to deal with it ourselves. Yes, Lord. And yes, we still may struggle with this issue. But Lord, hallelujah, it's not a hopeless struggle. You have already spoken to it in our hearts and lives. We will be set free. And we just bless you for that. Would you, would you pray for your neighbor right now and say, Lord, just cement this word in their heart right now. Lord, free them from condemnation. Free them from hopelessness. Cement this truth in their heart this morning in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Do it, God, I pray. Your word, O oh Lord, is true. Hallelujah. Praise God.